Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Huda. I'm your host, Jamil Rashid, and uh, I'm happy to welcome back Sheikh Mohammed Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for being with us. Jazakum, may Allah bless you. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Okay, let me just remind you of our telephone numbers. Our country code is 202, then it's 8555-248 and 249. And as usual, Please, if you do call us today, please take your television set sound right down so we get no interference. And please call early. We get so many calls each episode, and unfortunately, we don't have enough time. So please do call early. Sheikh, I've got a question here from the internet where I'm going to start with today. Uh, Sister Zainab from Saudi. Um, she asked a question uh, about getting up after the second rukah in a third or fourth rukah salah. She says, when we get back up, do we raise our hands and say, Allahu Akbar? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا All praise due to Allah, we praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one And whomsoever Allah leaves astray, no one can show him guidance I send the best, the best peace and salutation of one Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, As far as raising the hands after uh, rising up from the middle to shahud, this is a sunnah by the meaning it is recommended to raise the hands uh, in other positions in the salah other than takbiratul ihram in the following positions when one is going for ruku' of each rak'ah after finishing the recitation of the surah and he's ready to go for ruku' that's one position Allahu Akbar and upon rising up from ruku' he says sami' Allahu liman hamida and that is the second position then the third one is upon rising up from the second rak'ah, if you sit for the middle tashahud and going up, then you raise your hands, either while you're standing up or after you're completely stood up. Uh, so these are three positions which are recommended, and these are called hay'at. They do not really affect the validity of the salah. Uh, it is also uh, worth of mentioning here that uh, it's not mentioned anywhere in the school of Al Imam Abu Hanifa. That's why many people think raising the hands is only uh, while making takbiratul ihram. But it was narrated from so many companions, approximately 15, that they have seen the Prophet ﷺ raising the hands in these positions. So that's why it is a prophetic tradition. It is highly recommended to do so. And if you do not do it, it would not affect the validity of your salah. Jazakallah, <laughs> shukr. Okay, uh, Brother Norman from Abu Dhabi asked a question um, about a, a dua that he can recite. Uh, he wants to have a child. Uh, he says, here, is there anything that I can make dua with, any particular ayah of Quran I can recite that can help me? Uh, first of all, we uh, see, uh, see this opportunity and pray for him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you the good offspring, not Amen. just uh, any offspring, but Amen. a good righteous children. Allahumma ameen. And I ask the viewers to uh, uh, pray for the brother and his wife as well. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed us in the Quran, as we mentioned repeatedly, that the best mean of uh, accomplishing your goal is to seek forgiveness and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you uh, by saying or through saying, Astaghfirullah al uh, Allah the Almighty informed us in Surah Nuh that Prophet Nuh, peace be upon him, commanded his people as saying that فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدَرَارًا وَيُمْدِدَكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ mm -hmm. So Nuh, uh, peace be upon him, commanded his people to seek forgiveness and to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regularly for istighfar because this is one of the most important means of pro, uh, 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 increasing one's provision and giving uh, uh, the children and wealth uh, rain uh, falling from heaven and so on. So if one would stick to istighfar regularly and then ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant him whatever he wants as a worldly mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would answer this dua. This is one. Second, uh, it's also recommended to seek uh, this good of spring through the dua of Sayyiduna Zakaria alayhi salam when he supplicated as in the Quran, Rabbi la tadharni fardan wa anta khayrul warithi. Oh Allah, do not leave me as single, and you are the best of all ears. So this is a good dua as well. Uh, the best time to make dua is while you are in a state of sujood, while you are the nearest to your Creator. Also while drinking from zamzam water, since the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, zamzam lima shurib ala, drinking the water of zamzam is for whatever intention you drink it with. So if you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you the offspring, 
uh, hopefully Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would definitely answer. Uh, I need to give also an advice. When mm -hmm. one does so for a year, for two, for three years, in addition to seeking the medical aid, and he still does not have his dream of having a child, this is Allah's decree for him. He should not despair, nor should he object to Allah's decree. Jazakallah khair, yes, yes. Okay, we've got the first call of the day. Sister Um Khalifa from the United Arab Emirates. Sister, you're live and ask Kuda your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, I'd like to ask a question to the Sheikh. I actually called the last time, but um, I didn't hear the answer to my question in that series, so I'm sorry to have to repeat it again. Um, just a question uh, about a sister in Islam who converted around the same time as me, but uh, in the past couple of years she has since followed a different sect in Islam in a very strong way and um, is trying to convince some of the other sisters in our uh, Mahadara meeting that this is the best way to go. I'm just wondering how to advise her. Do I advise her? Do I stay away from the friendship? What is the best thing for my Afida and uh, for myself and for the other people in our group? Because her intentions are good, but uh, the way of her following Islam, uh, of course, is not. we feel is not correct when asking uh, uh, asking things of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was my first question. And my second question, if I may, um, is, it, is it okay for someone to say that they give their life for Islam, that they want to live their life just uh, giving it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Thank you very much. Barakallah <laughs> Sister Um Khalifa there from... Okay, we've got Sister Um Salama from the Emirates. Sister, you're live on Ask her your question, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For all the good work that you are doing. Yes, your question, sister. I have a, 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 there's a hadith that there will be 30 Dajjal before Qayama. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between the 30 Dajjal and Dajjal al Masiya? Okay. Secondly, mm -hmm. uh, if you are uh, prone to means, uh, uh, if these the judges are troubling you, how can you overcome them? Okay. Then uh, another hadith is about Isa alayhi salam will be taking the Muslim to Jabal al Tur. Hmm. Uh, walking, I mean, uh, uh, when there will be fitna from. Ajuj and Majuj. Hmm. Uh, why we will be go, going walking there when we have planes and okay. uh, other transport? What is the reason? Okay. Barakallah Fika. Sister Um Salama there from the United Arab Emirates. Sheikh, we did speak about uh, Sister Um Khalifa's question. We actually answered it in detail, but can you just give a, a short synopsis maybe of the the uh, the answer, I, I'll repeat the question, the question was um, there's a sister who, they both of them came to Islam together at the same time, this sister now unfortunately he started practicing in Islam which is not from the Quran and Sunnah, she wants to give advice to her, this sister is also giving da'wah to other sisters, how does she go about doing this? It's a very sensitive topic. Uh, I do remember uh, mm. handling this very very carefully by mm. saying that uh, first of all I would like to add to my previous answer that we're not being judgmental. Mm -hmm. We're not here to judge uh, whether this person is a believer or not. But we're only judging actions. Mm -hmm. In the light of what we get as a data of your questions and so on. So, whenever you have a sister who came to Islam with you and you know the history and so on. I remember saying that it is best to approach her from uh, the history as you guys, as how you guys came to Islam. You abandon your old religion your practices, because it was not monotheism. Basically, you're inviting somebody else besides Allah or other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now the sister is doing the same in the name of Islam. This is not a part of Islam that does not belong to the practices of Islam.
Islam is to invoke Allah alone and is to ask him alone. I also mentioned that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he's the top of this ummah, of this nation, said about himself that he's just a human and he's the deliverer of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we do not invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through him, rather we send the peace and salutation upon him. We follow strictly his guidance and his footsteps and this is the best way to practice his sunnah. Then whenever we come to invoke, we invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And we ask him only, we ask only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As far as how to approach this sister, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the golden rule, generally as how to give da'u. Ud'u ila sabili rabbika, uh, invite and call people to the path of your Lord through two means. Al-hikmah wal maw'idhati al-hasana, wisdom and good admonition and a good reminder. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have informed us about two companions. One was very righteous and the second was very wicked. So every time the righteous one would see the wicked, the corrupt person is making a sin, would say and object to him and try to forbid him from doing the evil. And until once he saw him doing something was very great, a great sin. So he said, by Allah, Allah will never forgive you. At that, Allah the Almighty ordered the angel of death to take uh, their, their souls, both of them. Then he resurrected them and he said to the one who was a sinner, but he was hoping that Allah would forgive him, even though he's committing a sin, enter into my heaven by my mercy. Then he said to the other one, then who was righteous, but he was judgmental. He said to the second that, by Allah, Allah will never forgive you. He said, Man Allah. Who is that who is giving commands and dictating to Allah uh, what to do? It is up to Allah. So he said, I have forgiven the sins of your friend, who is wicked, and I have... Uh, deleted and neglected all your righteous deeds because you're taking the task which is not appointed for you. Distributing uh, God's mercy is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what do you possess? What do you have? Only to invite with kindness, with gentleness, with hikmah. Yet you keep in mind, as I also mentioned in the last time, that every da'iyah, everyone normally likes to see the fruit of what he plants. But in the case of da'wah, your role is only to advise, is to enjoin what's good and forbid what's evil. Whether you see the fruit or not, your reward is guaranteed. إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ uh, this very valuable information were given to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it is applicable in the case of every da'ya. You will never guide those whom you like. It's not up to you. It is only Allah who guides whomever He wills. So your role is to remind, is to give them a wa'idah with gentleness, with kindness, with wisdom. You tell your sister that whosoever invokes other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is not an Islamic practice whether they call them the sect or that sect, that would be rejected. Allah the Almighty said, أَنَا أَغْنَى الشُّرَكَاءِ عَنِ الشِّرْكِ بِي مَنْ أَشْرَكَ بِي شَيْئًا تَرَكْتُهُ وَشِرْكُ Whosoever invokes anyone other than Allah the Almighty, or with Allah the Almighty, or does anything to please anybody else with Allah, or instead of Allah, the entire act would be rejected. And the person will be punished for that. Mm -hmm. So I hope your sister is watching right now and we advise her that whichever practice or religion that you have left to come to Islam, Islam is a real monotheism that you only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you need any assistance, that you only pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I do not necessarily mean that uh, prayer as far as the mandatory prayers and the nawafil, uh, which includes the physical uh, uh, movements in addition to the citations? No. I also mean a dua, invocations and supplications. Because indeed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in his sound hadith, ad-du'a'u huwa al-ibadah. Making dua, raising your hands and saying, oh, such and such, it should be only directed to Allah. Oh Allah alone. Give me, protect me, grant me, help me, have mercy on me. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it should not be done through anybody else simply because that used to be the practice of the Meccan pagans before Islam. Mm -hmm. And whenever Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam objected to that and he said to them, he argued with them, don't you believe in your creator? They said, yes. Isn't he uh, the one who provides for you? They said, yes. 
Isn't he the one who sends the rain? Yes. Isn't he the one who created the heavens and the earth, maintains your life, sustains? Yes, 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 yes. So why do you invoke somebody else? Mm-hmm. The idols, they said, مَا نَعْبُدُهُمْ إِلَّا نُيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَ Oh, Muhammad, we're not simply worshipping them. We're taking them as means of approach mm-hmm. to take us closer to God because we cannot simply communicate with Allah ourselves. We are so impure. We are sinners. These practices are in other folds religions as well mm-hmm. but in Islam whenever my seven ask you O Muhammad concerning me inform them without any delay فإني قريب I am very near mm-hmm. أجيب دعوة الداعي mm-hmm. إذا دعان and that's why all the Muslims must learn their aqidah mm-hmm. the, the pure essence of their belief which is based on one thing the oneness of Allah the Almighty. The word, the oneness of Allah the Almighty means several things. Means number one, the oneness of the Lordship. That there is no other Lord or Creator other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no other power other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second, the oneness of worship. And since He is the only Creator, Mm -hmm. then we should only worship Him alone. We should only seek the help from Him alone and pray and supplicate to Him alone. Thirdly, Allah the Almighty has very, very unique characteristics which no one else, neither a prophet nor an angel or any righteous one shares with Allah the Almighty any of his characteristics which are the beautiful names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe we have just the name, Mm -hmm. but the nature of each attribute is only exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the meaning of his statement fi surah al-ikhlas walam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad and no one ever is equivalent to him and he said laysa kamithlihi shay there is nothing ever that is similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so basically we have to begin from the scratch Many people, and I believe I've also mentioned that before, I have come across many people in, uh, in North America. They call themselves Muslims. They have reverted to Islam only by name. But unfortunately, they were captured by the wrong people. So they've informed them about the wrong practices, which they give them the name of Islamic practices. But by the, uh, the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we had the chance to speak to them, and they were much uh, uh, softer, and uh, able to understand because <clears throat> imagine somebody did not like all the false practices in their previous religion. They did not like that I have to confess my sins before a human like me. Mm-hmm. They did not like that if I want to ask God, then I have to go through somebody else. Then you come to Islam to repeat the same wrong practices again. Jazakallah, oh. Sheikh, for that uh, beautiful answer. Jazakallah Okay, we have brother Muhammad uh, on the line from Egypt. Brother, Jazakallah for holding on. You're live and ask her your question, please. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I want to ask a question. Yes, I'm please I'm Egyptian do. now, living in Belgium. And uh, now we have the Maghrib at 10 o'clock at night. And the Aisha is uh, one and a half uh, uh, after midnight. And the Fajr is almost three and a half. Yes, so, uh, first question, is it allowed to make jama' between Maghrib and Isha or not? Second question, for fasting sunnah, do I have to fast until 10 o'clock or can I fast until like the normal countries, until 8 or, or such countries like this? Mm-hmm. And also if uh, Ramadan came in, uh, in summer, uh, until when we have to fast, inshallah? So you're calling from Belgium? Uh, no, I'm now in Egypt on vacation, but I'm returning back to Belgium. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Jazakallah khair, Brother Muhammad. Jazakallah khair. Allah Thank you very much for that call. Okay, uh, Sister Hawa from Nigeria, live on Ask Huda. Jazakallah khair for holding on again. Uh, your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Um, yeah, Sheikh, my question is quite a long one. I have an ulcer problem, that is stomach ulcer. Mm-hmm. Last Ramadan, I was able to fast 10. Three in the beginning, then I fell sick. And I was able to, uh, I was able to fast um, seven on the last 10 days. I was advised because of my condition to give out a mood of the common food here in Nigeria, of which I did. 
Later on, I asked somebody else again, and he said, no, I wasn't supposed to give out the mood. But mm. as long as my author, that is the stomach author, is not. Okay, I think uh, we've lost the sister, Hawa, from Nigeria. I think we've got the gist of that question. And for the lengthy questions, it's preferable to send it via email. Yes, Jazakallah. Yes. So just to repeat that, if you do have a lengthy question, please do send it to email. We will forward to Sheikh Muhammad Salah. Okay, Sheikh, uh, the second question from Sister uh, Um Khalifa. Um, if somebody says, I give my life to Allah, I give my life to Islam, is that a, a saying accepted in Islam, Sheikh? As a matter of fact, that should be the case with every believer. Mm -hmm. The Quran says, Allah the Almighty commanded the prophets and Prophet Muhammad and all the believers to say what we say in the beginning of every prayer as a sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu the supplication of the beginning of every salah قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي Count with me mm. Say, O Muhammad, verily my prayers وَنُسُكِي mm -hmm. and my rituals, my ceremonies of hajj or others وَمَحْيَايَ mm -hmm. وَمَمَاتِي mm. Not only the prayers, not only the ceremonies of the ibadat, but my life mm -hmm. and my death all belong to Allah. قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ to all, all of that belongs to Allah, the Lord of everything that exists. لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَبِذَلِكَ أُمِرْتْ And I was commanded to وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And we have not, I have not created both the jinn and ins, but exclusively to worship me. Mm -hmm. So worship is not limited to offering the five daily prayers and adjacent nawafil, or fasting and performing hajj and paying zakah. No. Every aspect in our life simply could be an act of worship. The Prophet ﷺ informed us that uh, just smiling whenever you meet your Muslim brother this is an act of charity sadaqa tabassumuka fi wajhi akhika sadaqa removing a harmful object from the path of people that's an act of charity this is ibadah what about this the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said wa inna fi budhi ahadikum sadaqa having an intimate relationship with your spouse in halal is a ibadah when you recite the supplication before and when you do whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed you to do in a lawful manner and when you uh, seek in doing that avoiding yourself from committing the haram and having this relationship in an illegitimate manner this is ibadah as well so every aspect of our life could turn into ibadah when one goes to sleep and he performs wudu and he begins his sleep by reciting the supplications prior to going to sleep. And he uh, hopes that this sleep would give him enough rest so that he would get up in the morning to pray Fajr and work hard to provide for himself and his family. This is ibad. The Prophet wasallam heard the companions making some remarks. When they saw somebody who was muscular and working very hard, they were very impressed. They said, wow, if this man was working this kind of work and striving for the sake of Allah, would be very, very pleasant. So the Prophet ﷺ commented on that by saying that if he was working to provide for his family, this is for the sake of Allah. If he was working to provide for his elder parents, this is for the sake of Allah. This is ibadah. So my work, my earning becomes an act of worship for Allah. Lillah. Mm -hmm. Then if he was working for his youngster to provide for them, if he was working to uh, provide for himself, this is for the sake of Allah. Fahuwa fi sabilillah. Yet if he was working to show off and to be arrogant, mm -hmm. that is for the sake of Satan. So simply, my entire life as a believer should be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to His worship. Right away, some secular, when they hear that, they say, yes, yes, they want all Muslims to spend the day and night in the masjid. And according to my statement, previous statement, that's not true. The Prophet sallallahu did, did not accept that. He said, al-yadu al-uliya khayrun min al-yadu al-sufla wabda bi The upper hand is better before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the lower one. 
This is a figure of speech. The Prophet ﷺ means the upper hand is always the hand which gives in a charity. But the beggar and the one who takes, his hand is always lower. So he said the upper hand, the hand which gives, is better than the hand which takes. And Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once entered the masjid. And he saw a man was sitting, even between the prayers. And he noticed that repeatedly. So when he came off prayer time, he saw him sitting there. He asked him, O oh servant of Allah, what do you do for a living? He said, I don't. I just worship Allah. I stay in the masjid to contemplate day and night. He said, and who's providing for you? He said, my brother is working and I'm worshiping. So Umar al-Khattab used to have a rubber stick. He beat him out of it with it and he said, get out. Your brother is better than you. Life is a combination of Working to earn your living, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have guaranteed and secure for you, but He requires from you to do your part. Put your trust in Him and try to earn your living. And meanwhile, fulfill what Allah commanded on you to fulfill on certain times. And that's why the five daily prayers do not uh, occupy the entire day and night, but during certain times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I can give my entire life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Enjoy my life, have fun, try to make wealth, to try to be rich, try to possess whichever car I like, as long as it is from a lawful earning, send my kids to the best schools, uh, take my vacations in nice places, and that's all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It all depends on you. How do you formulate your intention? Jazakallah, Sheikh. Okay, we have uh, Brother Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Brother, you're live on Ask Koda. Your question, please. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, I apologize for asking the same question as I could not follow your last episode. Okay. Yes, my question is can I perform Umrah on behalf of my parents who okay. are who are alive and healthy also, but financially they are not able. Yes, okay. Yes, and my second question is mm -hmm. I have some savings for the construction of the house. And is that money due for zakah or not? Okay. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. Brother Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I think we did get that question and we didn't answer it in the last episode, but inshallah we're going to quickly go through it probably before. Sheikh, uh, just before we go to a break, I just want to ask you one of the questions of Umm Salama from the United Arab Emirates. She asked about the Dajjal. Um, she says, are there two types of Dajjal? Or is there just the one type of Dajjal? Whenever we say in the definite form, at Dajjal, then it is referring to the false Messiah whom the Prophet ﷺ predicted his arrival and appearance as one of the major signs that precedes the occurrence of the Day of Judgment. Mm -hmm. And he said wasallam, that there was not a single prophet before me, but he warned his people, his followers against the false Messiah, mm -hmm. and I am warning you against him. So if we say at Dajjal or al Masih al Dajjal, they are of the same. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Okay, the second question is that uh, when we come to the Dajjal, how are we going to combat him? What's the ways to take him away from us? How do we go about doing this, Sheikh? Uh, of course, uh, this is a question which would require us to go once again through all the major signs of the Day of Judgment mm -hmm. and handle each of them. But briefly, the Prophet wasallam informed us that the believers will be able to see between on the forehead, between the eyes, mm -hmm. one of his eyes will be uh, wiped, and uh, we'll see the three letters, kafara, kafara, or kafir. Mm. Uh, uh, he is disbelieved or he is a disbeliever. Every believer will be able to read it, whether uh, uh, illiterate or illiterate. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ provided us with a magnificent weapon that mm -hmm. would defeat uh, the false Messiah. He said that you can protect yourself by memorizing the first ten verses of Surah Al-Kahf. In another narration, the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. So why don't we memorize the entire Surah of Surah Al-Kahf and we recite it regularly, particularly on Fridays as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recommended. So this is a, a great uh, deal of fitna and test that many people will fail. Only those who will prepare themselves ahead of time and also would memorize or recite these verses of Surah Al-Kahf by the will of Allah will be protected from his riot. Jazakallah, his shaykh. Okay, just before we go to that break, we have Brother Sadiq uh, from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Brother, you're live on Ask Kodi, your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, uh, I want to ask, I had gifted one property to my brother a couple of years ago. 
Now he is in financial crisis. I would like to ask whether I can buy that property. And okay. I would like request. Uh, I would like to request Mr. Sheikh to uh, give some hadith reference or some Quranic verses in support of his answer. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Brother Sadiq there from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay, we're going to go to a short break and inshallah we'll return in a couple of minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Choices, chances, dreams, and goals. Many mixed emotions in my heart and soul. For some I made a plan and did the best I can. If God wills, things can happen. After all, I'm just a man. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ask Her. Please, just another reminder, if you do telephone us, please turn your television down. Let me just remind you of our telephone numbers. The country code is 202, then it's 8555-248 and 249. Okay, Sheikh, we've got a question here uh, from Sister um, Um Salama. Okay, uh, sorry, we just finished that. Sorry, Brother Muhammad. Um, he's from Belgium. He's living in Belgium. He's originally Egyptian. He's back in Egypt. Uh, he's got an issue about the Salah times. Now, he says in Belgium now, uh, Maghrib Salah is at 10 p.m. Uh, Isha is somewhere after midnight and uh, Fajr is at 3.30 in the morning. Now, his questions are, can he join his Salah, his Maghrib and Isha? That's the first question. Uh, may Allah keep your brother Muhammad and all the Muslims who are living in the West in non-Muslim uh, countries steadfast on his straight path. Mm. Uh, mm, definitely right. your best defense mechanism again is going astray is adhering to the prayers so stick to offering the prayer on time and be patient yes indeed it would require you a great deal of patience as long as there is a daylight as long as there is a sunrise and a sunset there is a day and night then you must stick to the prior times, which will be determined according to the sun, not according to the time. So we don't go by 4 o'clock in Egypt. For instance, they pray us, so let me pray us here, even though it is way before time or mm -hmm. past time. Right. We go by the proper time, as explained, even though Aisha now is going to be very late, mm -hmm. while Fajr is at 3.30. That's why we were created number one to fulfill what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to do. Uh, many people are living in, in certain areas, the time will be a great challenge for them. Uh, yet, they still have to offer the prayers on time. And as far as joining the two prayers together, this is not valid in this condition. This is not one of the excuses. Because the Prophet ﷺ would join the prayers if he was traveling or during certain uh, circumstances such as heavy rain, uh, fear, etc. But it should not be a habit that simply because the Isha times late that we join Maghrib and Isha and we sleep early. So may Allah uh, give you strength and keep you steadfast and uh, uh, deliver our greetings to your brothers and sisters in Belgium and we pray for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make them strong in faith. Jazakallah khashak. Okay, we have Sister Um Hudayfa from Libya. Sister, you're live on Ask Hudayfa. Your question, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have three questions. Okay. Uh, the first one is um, uh, my family is not Muslim and um, they are not Christian either, they're atheist. But my question is because um, 
I'm pregnant, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'm wondering about names, what names you can have, because I'm not sure if I want an Arabic name, because it's difficult to pronounce and other issues. So I'm wondering what names are permissible to choose from that are not Arabic. Okay. My second question is, um, my mother, she can find a work for me with just women. Uh, it's personal assistant for physically and psychologically ill people. So my question is, since I'm not a family member of these people, am I allowed to clean their aura and their private part if they take shower or go to the toilet? Okay. And the third question is, uh, what clothes, um, what colors on clothes are permissible? Because there is a general understanding amongst women that we should not wear white on our clothes. And I read one hadith in Sahih Bukhari that men should not have clothes that are colored in saffron. And I'm not sure if I understand what this hadith means. Sure, okay. Okay, yes, I can hear you. Sister Um Hadaifa from Libya. Okay, Sheikh. Uh, Brother Mohammed from Egypt, who resides in Belgium, uh, had his next two questions, and we're going to put them together about fasting. Again, he's asking, when it comes to fasting, fast is going to open now at 10 p.m., because that's the Maghrib time, and in Ramadan especially, it may go even later. What do I do? Can I open my fast early? Uh, that's why I began my answer to the previous question by saying, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبِرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ You are required to uh, gain a great patience. As long as you see the sunrise and the sunset, you must stick to that. So that means even if the daylight lasts for 14 hours, 18 hours, you must not break your fast before sunset. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sister Hawa from Nigeria. Um, she's speaking, um, she got cut off unfortunately, but I think I got the gist of the question. Uh, she had a stomach ulcer, may Allah relieve of this pain. She said, I fasted for the first 10 days of Ramadan and then the last 7 days of Ramadan. I was told the days that I missed I had to give some compensation for, so I fed some people with the, with the local food. She said, I was told later on this was incorrect. I, is this the situation, Sheikh? Simply as far as uh, making up the days which one would miss of fasting during Ramadan, mm -hmm. if one is capable to fast in the future, then he or she should make them up. But if one is chronically ill, certain illnesses, doctors would ban their patients from fasting period mm -hmm. because it would affect their health negatively or deteriorate their health. So we tell them you don't have to fast because of the advices of the trustworthy doctors. And in instead, you would give the fidya, which is feeding one miskin per each day, one sa of food and so on, yani one meal. Uh, but if the person is expected to be healed soon or later, maybe a year or so, then he's still uh, uh, buying by making up these days by fasting. Jazakallah khair, Okay, uh, Brother Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we did answer his questions. So, Brother Muhammad, we did go through both of these questions in detail. So, please, if you do miss a program, maybe it's better just to email and we can give you the reply. But I, I'll ask you, Sheikh, if you can briefly give an answer. The first is, can he make Umrah uh, for his parents? Uh, and the second is, he's saving up some money to buy a house. He wants to know these savings that he's collecting, uh, are they zakatable? One, for uh, any person who's not physically capable you may perform Umrah on their behalf. And I mentioned the condition that you must have performed Umrah on your behalf first. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing Umrah on behalf of several people, then you cannot combine all of them with one intention. But you do each Umrah on behalf of each individual separately. Uh, secondly, as far as your saving, as long as you still maintain uh, this amount of saving in your account during this cycle, even if you're saving days to buy a house or to get married or to perform hajj, it is indeed zakatable. Okay, we've got another brother, Muhammad, from the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Brother, your life on our scholar, your question, please. Assalamu yes. alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, hello, Shaykh. Uh, my, I have a question about shirk. Uh, if the people uh, that worship the idols had the pure intention of uh, really getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm. then uh, how come the, the, the punishment for doing that is uh, severe? Okay. And the second question I have is uh, about marriage. Uh, is, a, is a woman allowed to have another wali uh, in marriage? 
even though her father is still alive. Okay. Yes, thank you. Barakallahu yeah. feek. That's Brother Muhammad from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia there. Okay, Jazakallah khair, Brother Muhammad. Okay, Brother Sadiq from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh. Um, asked a question about paying uh, or buying his house back from his brother. He gave his brother a gift, which was a house property. His brother's in financial difficulty. He wants to buy back this property. He wants to know, is he allowed to buy back this property? And if so, is there any evidences that you could give forth? You see, number one, whenever you give a property or an item to somebody else, whether it is your brother or anybody else, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as long as you give it to that person, whether with a compensation, I mean you sold it or you gave it as a gift, the, the position and the ownership will be transferred completely to mm -hmm. the second person. Mm -hmm. It becomes his. Now he's free to sell it, he's free to rent it, and he's free to sell it to whomever he wills. So if he wants to sell it back to you, as long as he would get the cash out of that or whatever mean of uh, compensation, that is permissible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, And Allah made uh, trade lawful while he prohibited riba. And the original condition in things like that is the permissibility, unless if there is a restriction that is laid down by the shara, and there is no such restriction in this case. Jazakallah hashik. Okay, we have a, a couple of questions from Sister Om Hudayfa from Libya. Uh, the first um, is that her family are, are not Muslim, they're, they're atheists, and um, because of this, she's pregnant, mashallah, generally. She's, she wants to know about the names now. What do I do? She doesn't want to have an Arabic name. She said this may be difficult uh, for them. So what names can we name our children if they are not to be Arabic names, Sheikh? Um Hudayfa, I begin by asking Allah the Almighty, sincerely from the bottom of my heart, may Allah please your heart by guiding your entire family and bringing them to Islam. Ameen. 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 Allahum Mahdihim, Allahum Mahdihim, Allahum Mahdihim. Second, I like the name Umm Hudayfa, and Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, one of the great, the great companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was uh, also known as Katimu Sirj al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entrusted him with some very valuable secrets. Mm -hmm. Maybe in another uh, show that we can discuss about uh, Hudayf ibn al-Yaman particularly, he's such a fantastic companion. So this is a beautiful name. And since you've already chosen such name, and you like it, and it's easy to pronounce, there are other beautiful names. I do not like to dictate to you whichever name you choose, but perhaps Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Mm -hmm. uh, you can take Mus'ab. His name is the first ambassador in Islam. Uh, and as our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, of course, that the best names are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. So whichever name you choose, and if you have a name in mind, and you would like to ask whether it is okay or not, whether an Arabic name or a non-Arabic name, you can email me directly, and I would uh, help you, inshallah, to uh, make your final selection. Jazakallah khair, Okay, the second question from the sister um, is about work. Her mother's found some work for her to work with the physically disabled people. She wants to know these people are not my relatives. Am I allowed to work in this environment? They're women. Do I like to clean them, to bathe them. Am I allowed to do this? This question is related to uh, seeing and touching the aura, the private parts, whether the great aura or the aura that's between the knees and the navel of any individual who is totally stranger to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is permissible in certain conditions, mm -hmm. in such, uh, such as in cases of uh, physically disabled people, handicapped patients, mm -hmm. but it will be with conditions. Number one, that the person would only uh, get to see and touch the part that needs to be cleaned or operated on or mm -hmm. checked on, not any part else. Jazakallah Sheikh. Okay, the last question from the sister uh, was about clothing and colors. She wants to know what clothing, what colors are allowed for women and men to wear. And she said now, for example, that uh, she generally heard that white is not supposed to be worn for women and saffron for men. And she gave some evidence for that for the men. Um, some guidance, Sheikh? Fi Zad al Ma'ad ibn al Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him. And this is a beautiful uh, biography of the Prophet, وسلم, which includes him. also his traditions and with further elaboration. I highly recommend for the seekers of knowledge to own and read this book thoroughly. It's called Zad al Ma'ad. Mm. Uh, Ibn al Qayyim, may Allah have mercy on him, discussed this in details the issue of wearing uh, saffron colored clothes for men, which is basically a pure red. Uh, or what we call it pungent red, mm -hmm. very flushy, very uh, attractive red. Uh, there is a prohibition against wearing red for men. 
In many cases, the Prophet ﷺ also was seen as wearing red, but the companion said it was not that pure red color. It was lighter than the brick red or mm. uh, what we call it very uh, bright red. So if the uh, color is red with other colors, that is permissible. But it is this like, this is the least ruling we could say for men to wear pure red. And okay, but for women, they may, wear, they may wear that. Now we come to the second part of the question as far as women wearing different colors. Some people say, no, a woman must wear black, which is not necessarily true. Uh, a woman may wear black or white or green or brown as long as a woman would make, the woman would make sure that she's wearing a loose clothes. The outer garment is loose. The colors are not mixed with other colors that, uh, that are so attractive. Uh, today, for instance, uh, I was uh, in one hospital, and I saw that some women are wearing a full hijab. But in my view, that was not hijab. So I came to uh, do what Allah commanded me and every Muslim to do, which is enjoying what's right and forbidding what's evil. I came to them and I said that, uh, I noticed that you sisters are wearing hijab, but this is not really hijab. Of course, we started the conversation and so on, and I explained to them. I figured out that, that these young ladies were not aware that that was wrong. They thought simply by wrapping their heads with a scarf, mm -hmm. that is a hijab. Wearing tight mm -hmm. clothes or very attractive colors of uh, a mix of every color, uh, uh, clothes that would really invite every man to look to examine the details <coughs> of mm -hmm. the body of this woman, they did not mind. So I tried to explain to them. And I think it is the role of the guardian of the family, the father, the brother, the mother, uh, the elders in the house to explain to the young girls that whenever or once a girl reaches the puberty age mm -hmm. or an age even before the puberty, once the girl looks like a grown-up girl, mm -hmm. that she must wear the proper hijab uh, of any color as long as it is modest, Lose and it covers the body without showing what would be attractive to men. Okay, we've got Sister Amina. I think it's the last call today from Oman. Sister, you're live on Ask Her Your Question, please. Sister Amina? Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh, and uh, Assalamu alaikum, brother. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Your question, please? I have a question on difficult pregnancy. Okay. I am pregnant now and I have some Masha complications Allah. in my pregnancy. I'll make it easy for you. I read in a book uh, called The Medicine of the Prophet that an amulet could be written on a pot, a Quranic ayah, and then this water could be drunk to reveal the complications. Can I do this? Okay. And then another question I have. Mm -hmm. I want you to know about the... Uh, Brother Musa Magwell's uh, welfare. Okay. Because we were speaking to him in some later programs about, uh, uh, in the past program, sorry, about him. Okay. Jazakallah khair. And then uh, one more question is okay. about uh, the Quran version, which is uh, Quranic verses which are downloaded in the GSM. Mm -hmm. Okay, sometimes uh, when we are. Uh, in the bathroom having a shower, something when we have urgent calls, mm -hmm. can we use the phone inside the bathroom to speak to the person? Okay. And sometimes these uh, ringtones are used, the Quranic versions of uh, ringtones are used. Could this be done? Okay. Thank you, Sheikh. Thank you, brother. Jazakallah khair. Uh, we will do, inshallah, sister. Jazakallah. That's Sister Amina from Oman there. Eh? Just going to write down all those questions, just got them done. Okay, and just, just one notice. Uh, the Sheikh is speaking about Zad al Ma'ad. It's available in English now, and I think the publisher is Dar es Salaam. So it's available in English, so uh, it's a very, very good book. I do recommend that. Okay, Sheikh. Uh, Brother Muhammad, uh, and I think it's the last question we're going to tackle today, unfortunately. So we're running a very short in time. Um, he asked a very important question, Sheikh, about shirk. He said, if people are worshipping idols, but sincerely trying to uh, get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you were speaking about before, why is this such so dangerous, why is there such a severe punishment for these people? Let me explain in a very brief statement mm -hmm. uh, the importance of that and how one should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do worship Allah according to His prescription. 
according to his will according to his way we do not worship Allah according to our desire he is the one who prescribes for us as how and when to do whatever he wants to innovating anything that definitely the first step that would take you down the steep to from bid'ah to shirk to kuf to completely exiting from the boundaries of Islam as far as supplicating to idols or wailing a talisman, ta'weeth, amulets, um, any means of protection, or seeking the help of Allah through individuals, especially those who have uh, passed away, going to their graves, asking them to uh, make my wife conceive, to give me a son or a, a girl, and so on. These are all equal in shirk. Whether you call upon an idol, or whether you call upon a wali who is dead. مَا نَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَّا لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَ That used to be the excuse of the Meccan pagans. Whenever the Prophet ﷺ tried to correct their disbelief by saying that, how could you meanwhile admit and submit to the oneness of Allah that He is a creator, but you are worshipping other than Him? They said, no, we are not worshipping other than Him. We are worshipping Him through them. And they were initially righteous people, they died, so that Satan made it seem fair to them to carve statues, and this is one of the reasons of the prohibition of pictures, statues, and so on, because by time they worshipped these people, and they considered them assistants of God, and so on. So, going to Allah through any other means, such as idols, or people who have passed away, or graves, these are all acts of shirk. If you want to ask him, then you ask him directly. And anything will be done through that will be rejected and will be considered an act of shirk. As we said, Allah the Almighty said, أَنَا عَنِ الشِّرْكِ The claim that their intention is good mm -hmm. is insufficient. Simply having a good intention would not take you to paradise. Guess what? Through my journey in da'wah, wherever I go, non-Muslims followers of every faith. They all claim that we're believers. Not only that, believe it or not, they believe that we believe in monotheism and we follow monotheism. And I really have to say it before everyone, and Allah is my witness, that there is no monotheism in any other religion but in Islam. This is a true monotheism. The recognition of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Alun is only in Islam, not in any other religion. So we figure out that uh, people really claim with good intentions that they are worshipping Allah. But their actions prove otherwise. That's why the Muslim scholars have concluded from the Quran and from the traditions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi that for every act, especially act of worship, to be accepted, it must fulfill two conditions. Mm -hmm. Pay close attention to these two conditions and you have to review yourself before and after doing anything and everything that you do and you believe is, it is a ibadah. The first one, it has to be sincerely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَا And they were not commanded but to worship Allah alone sincerely devoting the religion to him, to Allah alone. This is the first condition. The second, that any act you do, it has to be in compliance, in accordance with the Quran and with the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Other than that, if one of the two conditions has been missing, the act is completely rejected. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for that elaborate answer and a very, very fundamental point. There. So please do take note of that. Okay, we run out of time as usual. Please, uh, any more questions, do email us on ask at huda.tv. But until next time, I'll leave you with Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh.